All right, I want to welcome everybody in. I am Douglas Scarborough, board chair for the Economic Club of Memphis and also senior vice president and regional executive for the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. So welcome to today's session. This is a rapid response roundtable on recent developments in banking. This is something that we actually just came up with the idea for a couple of weeks ago when we were having a recent session with David Cordani, who's CEO of the Cigna Group, and thought about the need to not only provide information, but to very much the mission of Economic Club of Memphis, of providing a forum for leading citizens of Memphis to contribute to a better understanding of economic, political, and social issues facing us and linking us to the world. I want to thank you to a number of partners that we have that we reached out when we had this idea just probably a little over a week and a half ago. Uh, the Chairman's Circle with the Memphis Regional Chamber, also the Better Business Bureau with also the CFA Society of Memphis and the Economic Club of Memphis. I do want to tell you about, uh, you know, part of my duty as board chair with the Economic Club is to tell you about a couple of our upcoming events mentioned recently, we have that available online so you can stream that, that we have the CEO of the Cigna Group, a Fortune 12 company, David Cordani, that's available. And the next session will be on April 6th. And it's with Lynn William Kong, the Rudd Family Professor of Management at the Johnson Graduate School of Management at Cornell University. And that's gonna be at the Holiday Inn University of Memphis. It's gonna be talking about FinTech, uh, that is new technologies to compete with traditional financial methods. And the ABCDs of FinTech are thought of as artificial intelligence, blockchain, cloud computing, and big data. On the other hand, I gave the board chair, give my update about uh, Memphis Economic Club for the Federal Reserve. Jim would do the same, I'm sure. I'll uh, give a disclaimer that all these views are my own. They're not the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis or the Federal Reserve System. Last, I do want to remind you about membership with the Memphis Economic Club is available on the website. We have a number of events throughout the year, mainly through September through May. We have scheduled events and then also this series now, the recent, the rapid response roundtable will become a series and we will respond to things as they occur in our economy. Now I have the pleasure of introducing David Waddell, who will introduce our panelists. David is CEO at Waddell and Associates. And then Waddell and Associates is an SEC registered wealth management firm dedicated to enriching lives by providing clarity. He's an experienced CEO with a demonstrated history of working in investment management. He combines macroeconomic forecasting, ma macro market analysis, macro risk assessments, and also designs, uses all that to design portfolios for, for clients. If I remember correctly, David, you are a past uh, executive committee member with the Economic Club and also chair. I got to know David uh, a little a few years ago in 2006 as we were involved with then the Leadership Academy. He has a number. I've heard over the years his keen insights and opinions on the market uh, and the economy overall. But David does. He does a really, really good job. I'm glad to have him as a moderator today. He does a great job of cutting through that fall and getting to the core issues at hand as it deals with the economy. He's been seen on CNBC, Wall Street Journal, and also in Barron's. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, David. Douglas, thank you. And uh, just to streamline things, I'm gonna disband the committee. Go ahead and give the answers myself, uh, if everybody's comfortable with that. No, I'm just kidding. All right, so first of all, Douglas, because you're a fantastic and visionary leader for the Economic Club, I applaud you and the Economic Club for doing this rapid response roundtable. One of the things that we've talked about for years, um, even when I was chair, was how much talent and wisdom we had in the club itself. And I love the events. And I know everybody loves the events, but often I learn more at the dinner table than I learn from the podium. So in thinking about this discussion, this is a lot like a dinner table discussion at one of our events. And these are just esteemed members of your dinner table. So I'm going to think about this less as a panel and more like the discussions that typically occur at an economic club event. And if you haven't been, please come and uh, you're welcome to sit at my table anytime. Um, and I know everybody else here would be glad to have you. So let me introduce our table mates uh, for today. We've got McCall Wilson. Uh, McCall has a lot of C's. He graduated from CBU. 
He's been a CPA at a local accounting firm here, and he's been a CEO, I think I'm getting this right, for 21 years of the Bank of Fayette County. He's also been the chair of several bank-style things, American Bankers Association, community banks, um, I think the Tennessee Bankers Association. So not only is he a community banker, but he's got good perspectives system-wide, given all of the far-reaching conversations he has and all the leadership he contributes to his industry. So great to have McCall sitting with us at our table, past the uh, roles, McCall. Um, and then I got Michael Drury, who's been a longtime friend and a fantastic economist. Now, Michael began his uh, career, correct me if I'm wrong, at Lehman Brothers. Um, so I don't know. Uh, Gary Schilling. <laughs> okay. All right. Then, I don't I don't know if that sets the table for what comments we'll hear from you today, but I know you've been at McVeigh since 1992 and uh serves on the board of the National Association of Business Economics People, which is a big time dot deal. So Michael is a a, a, a magnet in, in the industry of economics, writes a fantastic weekly newsletter. If you don't get it, please subscribe. It's fantastic. And then Jim. I don't know you as well, but I feel like, you know, I read your bio and it's pretty substantial. So I'm going to go ahead and hit some of those highlights. First of all, Jim is vice president of the St. Louis Federal Reserve. And the St. Louis Federal Reserve is by far the best information source of all of the Federal Reserve banks, the FRED database being, of course, the, the crown jewel. Um, but anyway, so Jim also oversees some very important operations, including the discount window, reserves. I'm not even going to list all the things he's in charge of because it's it's a lot. Um, but he also chairs a conference that I haven't been invited to um, that, that does community bank research. So we've got a lot of intelligence um, at the table tonight. Um, and so what I'm going to do is just start with some questions to help lead us through what should be a lively discussion. So, are you all ready? Here we go. So, Michael, in 2023, we had this COVID. We had this huge stimulus, which I think gave $5 trillion specifically to people and businesses. It's three years later, banks are failing, and we need government bailouts. What happened? So the, the $5 trillion was dropped on an economy that was stopped at the time. So, of course, you were going to get inflation. Now, the inflation first showed up in assets because with the economy closed, you couldn't spend it anywhere else. But when the economy opened in 2021, you know, March, April, you, uh, you got the inflation started to really run in goods and services. Uh, and so now, basically, prices have risen about 20% over that period went from a $20 trillion economy to a $25 trillion economy. And the stock market's gone up about 20%. You went from about 3,300 up to 4,800, back down to 4,000, so about 20%. So, you know, that all made sense. The, the problem was the same $5 trillion that you gave to individuals and businesses ended up in banks as, as deposits. And the banks didn't have anybody to lend it to because everybody just cash rich from the federal government didn't want to borrow money. So a lot of it ended up parked at the Fed as uh, excess reserves where you earn interest on excess reserves. But some intrepid souls went out and bought treasury securities at anywhere from zero to 2%. And some made mortgages at anywhere from two and a half to, to three and a half percent. And now with interest rates rising rapidly, all that is underwater and you've got capital losses in the system. Now, the uh, the rise in interest rates was faster than any cycle that you've ever had before. And in my mind, that's because consumers and businesses are less interest, interest sensitive because they have these big savings cushions. And so you normally you raise interest rates until something broke and it wasn't the consumer and it wasn't uh, businesses. Now, you did break Bitcoin on the way or, or the, the cryptos. Uh, you did break American Car Center here in Memphis, you know, but they weren't big enough to, to rattle the cage until you got to SVB. And basically, you had a run on the bank, which exposed their capital losses. And the rest is history. At this. Thank you. Um, so, McCall, what was it like to be a banker during that period? The money ferry came, as he said, dropped five trillion. Suddenly, SVB three years later is gone. What has your experience been running a bank? for the last 36 months? 
uh, David, it's kind of like running with scissors. Uh, your mom told you never to do it. That's what we've been doing for the last few weeks, at least. You know, I, I'd like to back up 21 years. When I when I joined the bank in June of 2001, Prime dropped four and three quarters in a 12 month period, and we were caught on the wrong side of the spread. And so, being a small bank, we live by net interest margin. And so, when rates dropped, we had fixed rate CDs funding verbal rate loans, and our margin got squeezed. I didn't think I would live through that drastic of a change in the rest of my career. And then 21 years later, we see Prime go up 5% in a you know 12 month period. And so it has been, it's had a huge impact on our margin, but I will tell you COVID wasn't nearly as scary as the run on the bank with SVD for us. You know, our, our savers have been uh, punished in a low interest rate environment. And the borrowers have been rewarded for quite a few years. And now it has switched. And I will tell you, over the last six months, our margins get squeezed again because our deposits are repricing really quickly. The, um, the dynamics that Michael and McCall uh, just described are obviously the, the, the consequence, the result, the you know, coordination, the, you know, whatever you want to do at the Fed to take responsibility for the mess and the cleanup, you're welcome to do. Um, so, so what has the conversation been like at the Fed over this 36 month period um, from a policy perspective, but also a mechanics perspective in terms of what's been going on in, in the areas, the discount window and all the things that you oversee? Well, David, thank you, and 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 it's just great to be on a panel here with uh, with Michael and McCall as well. Um, uh, I, I will, uh, as Douglas noted, I'll uh, I'll offer the same disclaimer. I you know I I am a uh, I work for the St. Louis Fed, but the views I express today are my own, and and they certainly don't represent a broader view of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis or, um, you know, or the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. But but certainly appreciate uh, having the opportunity to chat today, and you know I will note I don't know if our our boundaries are always that intuitive but uh, Memphis is certainly in the Federal Reserve's 8th district which is uh which is headquartered in uh, in the St. Louis Fed and we have uh branches in Memphis, uh, Louisville and Little Rock. So you know when I, when we think about the uh, the last 3 years, you know, at the Fed, I guess you know there's very few analogs throughout history, right? It's it's very different as 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 was mentioned by both Michael and McCall. Um you know we you know, in March of 2020, we basically had a global economy shutting down, right? And there was a lot of uncertainty, right? Um, now, I will say, you know, the, the, the Fed, you know, so despite that, you know, the, the Fed's role is, is to support liquidity and stability of the banking system, right? Now, how we do that varies depending on the situation, but that's kind of the core mission. And that, that was, you know, really at the founding of the, of the Federal Reserve. Our primary tool to, to do that is the, um, is the discount window. And so, you know, at the time, you know, March 2020 hits, I think we all remember when things started shutting down, you know, there was conversations, okay, we'll be at this, this will be a week, this will be two weeks, right? And it turned out to be, you know, a year and a half in some instances, I know different states opened at different times. But, you know, what, you know, when you address uncertainty, and certainly we had a situation where, you know, certain businesses that required active customers, banks being one of them, you know, struggled a little bit, you know, banks were not only the epicenter for moving money out during the pandemic, but they were small businesses themselves trying to figure out, you know, onboarding technology and doing things to, to continue to serve their customers. So, you know, step one for us, the discount window, right? That's historically, it was a lender of last resort tool, right? We lend overnight, right? To, to just help kind of short-term liquidity challenges or extremely short-term. So we modified that, right? Made it into a 90-day primary credit uh, facility, right? So just a little more breathing room, you know, what's, you know, we didn't know how many weeks it, how the pandemic was going to be, but at least, you know, you take out a 90-day loan instead of always rolling over an overnight uh, discount window loan, you know, gives you a little bit more time, a little bit more breathing room. Um, you know, the other thing too, is that, you know, over, you know, I guess over many decades, when you look at emergency lending, and maybe part of this is just this idea of a lender of last resort, that feels awfully consequential, right? It feels like something bad has happened and I'm going to the lender of last resort. That has created a certain air of stigma. So we also felt in addition to making our facility a little more accessible, we needed to make it clear, not just through the discount window, but through our bank supervisors, right? Those that are in the banks, you know, working day to day um, in the banks, trying to understand, you know, examining banks and kind of doing the work that they do that this isn't 
you know, this isn't, there shouldn't be stigma associated with this, right? The discount window is a, is a liquidity management tool, right? Take advantage of it. Make sure you have it, test your line, which means take out a, take out a loan and repay it, but make sure that if you need the liquidity, uh, you can actually, you can actually do that. And then, you know, as was mentioned, so that was step one for us. And then in, I think early April, we got the, uh, the SBA's, you know, paycheck protection program, right? And that was, that was through the banks, you know, obviously working with the banks to make sure that, on the supervisory side, we were aware, you know, of, 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 of what was taking place and, and making sure that, you know, conversations were happening between banks and supervisors. But then on the discount window side, we also created a program, the and lots of acronyms, Paycheck Protection Program Liquidity Facility. And why did we do that, right? We, we, we did it because we wanted to, again, to support liquidity into the financial system, right? So if, if the PPP, the, you know, the small business demand really outstripped the capacity of the bank, we wanted them to have a source of funding to continue to lend into that program if, if that's what was needed in that particular community. And so, you know, ultimately that became a $200 billion program um, you know, for the Fed, to, again, to provide liquidity into the system. These are loans, loans that are repaid over time. There were two year and five year maturities, but you know, that was, uh, you know, that, so that was kind of that next, that next piece, right? So, so that's, that's different, right? That was 2020. Uh, and then really we've lived with that throughout 2021. And now we fast forward to today, right? And, and, and again, the, the Fed is actively providing liquidity to the banking system. So, I, you know, David, I guess I would say the, the circumstances are certainly different in March 2020, but I guess the core nature of what we do has not changed, but the approach is certainly different. Um, off script, I'm going to migrate a little bit on that. So you didn't have any control, of course, what the fiscal authorities were doing, right? So the That's correct. Fed was doing what the Fed was doing to react to the marketplace, but you didn't have any control over what Congress, the president, was going to do from fiscal stimulus standpoint. Um, now we're in an environment where, and we're going to talk a little bit about the tools for policy. How much discussion is there in the Fed of the responsiveness of the fiscal authorities? We've got divided government there, right? How much energy goes in? Because because when you take what it, what you did from a stimulus standpoint, and then you think about all the stuff that came out of you know Congress. Um, that's what created the multiplier effect I think Michael was talking about. So how do you manage the interplay um, in, in y'all's modeling between what politicians might do and, and how it has been done? You know, that's a good question. I mean, and, you know, as someone who's, uh, you know, followed us and followed the Fed, you know, there's a pretty solid line between kind of monetary policy and fiscal policy, right? And what, what the Fed does and you know, and what, uh, you know, what the government does, you know, our interest really starts when it comes to, especially when it comes to providing liquidity to the banking system. That's kind of where, where, it, where it starts and ends for us, at least on that side, right? So the, you know, the, 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 the fiscal authority is going to react uh, or not, right? We've had other instances through history where the fiscal authority does not react, right? So, you know, the extent to which you kind of take in all the available information, you see what, what is necessary to ensure that the banking system is, you know, is kind of operational, is functioning, has access to liquidity, uh, but also, you know, it's you know, each crisis is a little bit different. You know, one of the um, one of the one of the big things, and McCall, you might remember this as well. You know, during the um, you know during you know there was so much uncertainty back in March of 2020, right? The, the the message from supervisors at the time, a very public message, was you know, this is why you know like lending into the economy, right? Is why you know is why banks are here and why the Fed is here, right? You know, ultimately that natural tendency in a crisis to pull back is what can exacerbate, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, a crisis. So really our, our role is to make sure that the banks and, 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 and the Fed itself can lean into that crisis and keep, you know, keep credit flowing, even when maybe the initial tendency might be to pull back, right? So that's, I mean, ultimately, that's kind of our thinking on those things, you know, in terms of a interplay, you know, you kind of, you find, you know, we sometimes use the term, you find that surgical response that's going to have the greatest impact um, or that you think is going to have the greatest impact at the time. Um, thank you for that. By the way, I blame them, not you for the inflation. <laughs> um, so McCall, uh, you can pick a bank. You can be the CEO of SVB or the CEO today of First Republic. And can you please explain to us what happened to your bank? You know, um, Walter uh, Budget made a comment, said that when a bank has to prove that he's worthy of credit, no matter how good his argument is, he has no credit. And so it's hard to stop a loan on the bank. 
you know, I don't know the management team at SVB, but I'm pretty sure they're good guys. They probably have a family. They'll probably take care of their kids. They come to work every day. They, they do the best they can. But they made some bad decisions, and they um, I don't think they handled risk appropriately. Now, they had a concentration in the tech industry. They had a large number of accounts that were over uh, the insured limit, some north of 90%, which is very uncommon. When the Fed increased the rates, their bond portfolio went underwater. They had, I think, a $100 billion bond portfolio, and it was not hedged. And so they had a massive unrealized loss. When Twitter, the Twitter sphere starts spouting that they're having issues, huge unrealized losses, and, and most of the market doesn't understand that, you know, we have an unrealized loss. Our bank has a $6 million unrealized loss. We have 76 million in capital, and I have the ability to hold those securities until maturity, so I won't recognize the loss. Had there not been a run on the bank, SVB could have held those securities until maturity and would not experience the loss. So I think social media, Twitter, some of the talking heads, the Mark Cubans, the Bill Ackmans, if you go back and look at what they said, I think that that put fuel on the fire. You know, the customers had, in my understanding, contracts that they would keep all their uh, money at that bank in order to get loans from that bank. And I'm not sure if that's an anti-tying provision or whatever, but in the end, the customers broke that contract and pulled their money out. And that, that may be a, a legal option for the bank for Cedar FDIC. You know, the regulators, from our experience, you know, and I can tell you that during the financial crisis, we actually made money, not very much money. And we were criticized uh, for our earnings. And I was quick to point out that we made more money than First Tennessee, Regions, and SunTrust combined, but that didn't weigh, uh, and I didn't carry any weight with the regulators. And so we had a comment about our earnings. You know, we worked on it, we improved it, we got better, everything's fine. If you give the regulators too big of a stick with SVB, and I'm sure they had comments on risk management, but do you really want a bank shut down that has the ability to turn around? And so I think uh, it's hard to blame the regulators when there's a process to work through issues. You know, the politicians, you can say that if we were not giving away free money, the Fed wouldn't have to raise the rates as quickly as they did. And so a bank can adjust to a change in rate. It's very difficult to adjust to a rapid change in rates. And so in my opinion, SVB didn't have to fail. Did they have a concentration in tech? Absolutely. But banks have concentration in ag. Banks have concentration in small business. Banks have concentration in consumers. And you don't want to shut those down. It needs to be managed properly. And so I would choose not to be the CEO of SVB. But again, every bank's insolvent if the customers want their money today. And so SVB didn't have to fail. So that's a, that's a great transition back to you, Jim. Um, if if this is really a liquidity issue and not a solvency issue, because the treasuries are going to mature, they're risk free. By the way, um, I learned that in economics 101. Evidently not. But um, if they're just going to mature and pay off at par, then it's just a duration mismatch issue. So the Fed has dealt with. We dealt with the repo panic back in 2018. Has dealt with liquidity issues before in the banking system. Um, basically what McCall is saying is it, it was that outflow of deposits and then the fire sale potential on those and, and the realization of the unrealized losses that led to the downfall. So what has the Fed done to backstop bank liquidity and how much uptake is there systematically of the new programs that you've launched? No, that's a good question, David. And, you know, one thing I'll, I'll just say in, in, in relation to, uh, you know, to SVB is, you know, because we've you know, we did launch a new program, and I'll, I'll, I'll discuss that here in a second. But you know, I've, I've heard some some commentators say that you know, if that had been in place, um, you know, may, McCall maybe SVB wouldn't you know wouldn't have failed, right? But obviously, the the institution failed on March 10th, and on March 12th, which 
you know, it's pretty quick in terms of, uh, you know, turning around a, a major liquidity facility. But, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve launched the Bank Term Funding Program, or just to give us all another acronym to uh, put in uh, kind of uh, economic history, the uh, BTFP, which is a little more difficult to, to say than some of the others. But, you know, the idea here is, is, is exactly that, right? You know, first off, let's, let's bolster institutions' capacity to safeguard deposits. And how are we going to do that? You know the mechanism that you talked about before. You know if you've got a if, if you've got a if you've got deposits coming out right. And one of the figures I saw was like forty billion dollars exited. You know SVB in like less than twenty four hours. I mean that's just staggering, right? And you know there's some interesting detail. Just as an aside, you know the vice chair for supervision for the Federal Reserve, Michael Barr, just testified earlier uh, earlier today. There's some really interesting. Uh, and I haven't had a chance to go through his entire testimony, but there's some really interesting detail in there, which I, I would I would recommend to, to anybody. It's up on the uh, uh, Federal Reserve's um, Federal Reserve's website, right? But right. So if if you know if if some of these uh, these assets that have lost value in a rising rate environment, if you need to liquidate those in order to meet redemptions, you're going to sell those at a loss, right? And that's going to hurt. That's going to hurt the institution. So really what the bank term funding program is, is it's, it's targeted toward, you know, insured depositories, you know, here in the United States. Um, um, and, you know, the idea is that, you know, the collateral, it's, it's, it's a very specific collateral, right? So it's, you can pledge direct obligations of certain, you know, government agencies, that's the Department of the Treasury, GSEs, Fannie and Freddie, um, also, mortgage-backed securities, um, fully guaranteed by Ginnie Mae or Freddie Mac, are also eligible. There's a whole list on the discount window website of eligible collateral, but you can borrow. You know, you, you basically pledge. You pledge collateral, and you can borrow at par, right? So, I mean, that's a that's a that's a pretty big deal, right? Because the market value right now of, of, of I think all of those securities is likely below the par value of that security. With the understanding that giving and these are these are loans for up to one year, and you know giving institutions the ability to to borrow at par value against those securities with no haircut, you know provides a lot of liquidity into you know into the system, or at least creates that opportunity for liquidity for banks that need it. Now, you know one of the things that um, you know just looking at numbers at this point, and and, and again the H41 release is where you can see uh, balances, um, and it comes out every Wednesday, so would recommend that. For, for anybody to just kind of look at borrowings. But through last week, March 22nd, it looks like, you know, through, and not just through the BTFP, but also we've seen discount window lending increase because uh, the discount window takes a wider, um, uh, wider array of collateral than, you know, than, uh, than the BTFP. Um, but we're looking at 394 billion in new system liquidity in the past two weeks through those through our through our main program. So, you know, again, I guess my, my first comment is also my second and probably my third comment when, you know, when 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 there's stress in the banking system, it's about liquidity. That's why the Federal Reserve was was created. It finds different ways to provide that liquidity, but you know, at, at its core, that's that's what it does. And so this is a, a new example of that, uh, you know, of that mechanism for doing that. Excellent. Michael, be patient. I got one more in this ping pong match between the banker and the regulator, and then you and I are going macro. Hey, uh, McCall, does that solve the problem? Does having this liquidity facility provide the liquidity necessary for the banking system to stabilize? It, it is a step in the right direction for certain banks. You know, there are a lot of options out there. I mean, you mentioned earlier, I'm chairman of the Tennessee Bankers this year. And so I've been traveling from Memphis to Mountain City, trying to meet the 122 headquartered banks in Tennessee. And great banks in our state, strong banks in our state, banks that serve a mission and support their community. But if you're in a rural community, and to make things simple, you bring in $1,000 in deposits, and you can only loan out 500 of it. There's not a loan demand in a small community. You had to put that $500 somewhere. Well, the bank put it somewhere safe in treasuries and agencies. Well, those all went underwater. And, and so the banks did the conservative thing because smaller banks are not going to hedge it. Now, you could argue that a $200 billion bank should employ hedging strategies. But our bank, the morning, um, I came to the bank on the weekend that there was potential failure. And I sent an email to our employees and explained to them uh, what was going on in the market. And, you know, I kind of used the story, it's a wonderful life in a, in a bank run. 
When I came in Monday morning, I immediately drew uh, an advance from the Federal Home Loan Bank. And the Federal Home Loan Bank, another government agency that is um, a sister to Fannie and Freddie, and I brought that liquidity into the bank. I could have gone to the discount window, which should have been another option. But I made sure that we had plenty cash on hand or in our correspondent account to meet the, the needs of our community. Now, we didn't have a run on the bank. I, I will tell you that there's a difference between an account holder and an account number. And if you know the account holder's name, it's easier to calm them down. And so all of our branch managers, customers call them and they walk through it. And the customers either satisfy the answer or we found a way to insure their money. Most people do not understand FDIC insurance. You know, if you have a trust account, there's beneficiaries that you can get insured. You know, you can structure between husband and wife, children, pay on death accounts. A lot of people, it was simply, they were not worried about their 500,000 on deposit and we were able to get that insured and they were happy. Some of them, I had one gentleman that had um, a million eight on deposit and he called me personally and said, what would you do if you were in my shoes? And I said, well, if I had the president's number, I wouldn't really worry about it. And he goes, that's a very good point. Talk to you later. And I'm the phone up. And so to me, the, the BTF, the BTFP, excuse me, the acronyms kill me. The Federal Home Loan Bank, the discount window, all those help meet our recruiting needs. But the biggest thing is calming the public, having the public reassured that their money's safe. You know, we were founded in 1905. 28 years before the FDIC. We existed eight years before the Federal Reserve. We survived the financial panic of 1907. We survived the Great Depression without the help of the FDIC because our customers believed in us. And I think that's the importance of community banking. Our country needs large banks, it needs regional banks, and it needs community banks. And, and the fear of mine is that people are saying the only safe spot to put money is in the big four, the big five. That is terrible for our country. It's terrible for our communities because J.P. Morgan's a great bank. You know, we will never do what J.P. Morgan does, but J.P. Morgan does not care about the consumer in Fayette County or Hardeman County. It's not in their market. So that's who we're there for. So um, last question on this, and then we'll go to Michael. We'll do some macro. So the spread between what you pay on deposits and, you know, the feds now raise rates again and signal they might like to do it some more. We'll come back to that, Michael, um, is is five percent, four and a half percent. Now that sort of everybody's become aware that I can move out of my deposits into a money market fund so I can get paid nothing on my deposits and take the risk of a bank failure or I can get paid 5% in a T-bill without taking risk. So that cash shorting that's happening across, and I've seen it in the FRED database, another plug for the St. Louis Fred, uh, Fed, you know, you see the drain in deposits because people aren't mad at their banks. They would just rather earn five than less. What does that do to the banking system in general? Um, and how does that affect your ability to loan funds to the, you know, the main, main street Americans? You know, banking is a low margin business. And so we survive on a three and a half to four percent spread, very low markup on our money. We pay you one, we loan it out at five percent. Now the duration risk, you got to make sure you match it, your asset and liabilities. I will tell you our balance sheet um, is really a third non-interest bearing accounts. You know, everybody's checking account, savings account, just just small accounts. Then we have a third money market. And then we have a third CDs and CDs, truthfully, it's more for a, a, a more mature person. You know, young people don't really go into CDs a lot very now, but I will tell you, our money markets reprice so rapidly. You know, you can get between three and a quarter and probably 4% on a money market at our bank. You can get over 4% for a CD on our bank, depends on amounts and terms. But what happens is when rates go up so quickly, our loans haven't repriced yet. And so that, that's where the banks are hurting on margin. But again, this is really a timing issue. It's back like when I was an accountant. It's a timing issue. It'll correct itself in a year. And so assuming the Fed stabilizes rates, slows down, banks will catch up, their margins will improve, and everything will be fine. All right, Michael, we got all that to sort of 
filter through the macro lens. So if if the banks are now sort of navel gazing and looking at their balance sheets and wondering, you know, what do I do about cash sorting? And is this program that Jim's rolled out enough? Um, you know, what does that do to the macro economy? Does it move us towards recession? What does it mean for inflation? Because the reason we did all this was to invert the yield curve, to slow the economy, to, to tamp down inflation. You know, where are we in the campaign to, to knock down inflation by using recession as a tool? So the way I explain it to people is if you're driving down the highway at 80 miles an hour and the economy was running 3%, so it was running hot, and you see a cop on the side of the road, a bank regulator, you slow down to 65, you slow down to the speed limit. But if you come around the corner and you run into a fog bank, you slow down a lot and you slow down below the speed limit, you slow down maybe even slower than you have to just for safety. And your behavior affects all the other cars around you. And that's where we are right now. We're in that fog bank where we're trying to find clarity. No one runs into a dark room fast. So you have to expect that right here in front of you, the economy is going to slow down. Now, the question is, how fast and what do authorities do about that to offset it? If money leaves the small banks and runs to the big banks, as has been happening a bit here, uh, you know, the big banks don't have an immediate use for that funding either, right? So what did we find at, at JP Morgan is they took some of their new deposits, a lot of which came from Signature and, and SVB. And they put it at First Republic. Now there was a little arm twisting to get it there, but First Republic's got a very tasty little portfolio to pick up. And we've seen First Citizens went out and picked up a tasty little portfolio. And we've seen New York Community Bank went out and picked up a nice tasty little portfolio. So I mean, you know, it's not all losers here. There are winners and losers. You punished the capital investors and some debt investors at these banks. The depositors have been left whole so far and other banks have now become larger and hopefully they'll, they'll be more profitable because they'll make less bad risk decisions than the folks who went out. Unfortunately, this is capitalism. I mean, you, you have winners and losers all the time. We got here because the government, and I won't name which institution, decided that interest rates should be low, which meant that anybody who was a small saver was punished. And that meant that big corporations were able to borrow and make dividend payments and buy back stock. And it was very good for the stock market in the top end of the economy. It was very bad for the small saver in the low end of the economy. And now that's reversed and it's gone back the other way. So, you know, how is this balance going to work out? My argument is that is that, you know, the the low end of the totem pole in the labor market, which has always been where recessions start, they're in a much better position this time around than they've been in in many, many, many years. Beyond my business career, which is 40 years, um, you know, so you had you had 69 million people receive an 8.7 percent raise at the beginning of this year from the federal government. Now you've got people. We're earning 4% on their deposits that two years ago were earning one. It, there's not all losers here. There are winners in this process. And the question is, how is the new balance going to come out? It's easy to see the losers, like housing. But it's not always easy to see the winners. I mean, you've been to, you know, if you're trading in oil, oil is below 70 bucks a barrel or had been the last few days. I mean, there's an offset. You're, you're going to get some behavior that's stimulative to the economy to offset. So. You know, the biggest question is, how is the Fed going to react from here? Are they done raising rates? Are they going to go further? I've seen numbers anywhere from zero to 100 basis points for the, you know, the bank reaction as, as a hike in rates. If it's 100 basis points, then the Fed certainly, because the Fed wasn't going to go 100 basis points. If it's zero, you know, if two weeks from now, we're all going, oh, nothing to see here, move along, then the Fed might go again. But that had been an environment where they had much better clarity that they weren't looking through the fog. And so, uh, you know, it's uh, six weeks, eight weeks, I can't remember, to the next Fed meeting. And, uh, you know, we're all going to be on tenor hooks over that period. Uh, but I think the economy is still fundamentally strong enough that uh, un unless new names start popping up, 
and the new names appear to be in Europe, not in the United States. Uh, you know that that uh, I think we're probably going to be all right. So, uh, what are your expectations for inflation? I mean, everybody quotes year over year six percent, blah blah blah, and then if you look at the three month, you know, rolling average, it's a different story. I mean. Is inflation still the boogeyman or is this banking yeah. issue the boogeyman? Well, I, so both. I mean, because as long as inflation is the boogeyman, then the, the fact that the Fed may raise rates puts pressure on the banks. Uh, you know, so that, that becomes the question is, between now and the next meeting, does the fact that oil is trading well below what it traded for the last four months, does that get you a zero on the CPI in one of the next two months coming up? It's not, I have heard no one discuss this, but you know, the oil is uh, 4% of the CPI index. It's down 10%. You do 10% on 4%, you get a negative 0.4. Most people thought inflation was going to be 0 0.3, 0 0.4. So you could get a zero. You get a zero, we're in a whole different world. I mean, uh, and, and that, you know, these are the kind of offsets that are out there that are not being discussed that I think are, are going to have an impact on the economy as we go forward. Um, quick point of administration here. Um, we do have a, a built into the agenda time for questions and answers. Um, and so if you'll enter them into the Zoom Q&A, um, I'll see them. And at the end, we'll sort of filter through them and hopefully get some reactions to make this a, a bigger dinner table, very large dinner table. Um, so, so Jim, can you give us any insight into, you know, the volume of conversation within the Fed relative to inflation versus what's going on in banking? I mean, you know, I know there's a lot to pay attention to, but do you feel like something's got the, the attention of the Fed more, one more than the other? Or is it still an inflation story? And by the way, as, as Powell sort of stylized, it's the right. regulator's problem to deal with the banks. Well, um, you know, I think just to just to bring it back to Chairman Powell, right? He did, um, you know, he did opine after the last meeting that um, you know any kind of rate cut in, um, you know, in 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 2023 was was off the table, right? And in fact, the, the latest FOMC projections right now are signaling, um, you know, again, it's just a signal, you know, one of one of the, you know, you. One of the things that I think every FOMC member says is, you know, they are, we are as an organization data dependent, right? You have to adjust when you get new information. But right now, the current uh, current projections are signaling, you know, one more rate hike this year and no cuts until 2024. So I think that, you know, that that, that gives at least a point of view in, in, in kind of today's, you know, in today's climate. Um, you know, some of the other things that, you know, we're seeing, you know, there's, there's heightened uncertainty right now, just among credit conditions, uh, you know, the extent to which they'll tighten, that's, that's going to have, that can have an impact, um, you know, and, and again, I think everybody in the Fed and everybody kind of in, in the markets is watching this closely. And, you know, I think the Fed will adjust expectations, you know, as, uh, you know, as needed in those, you know, in those situations, but, um, you know, for the for the most part, and our own president here, uh, St. Louis President Fed President Jim Bullard, has said that um, you know inflation is still too high, right? And there, you know, that that needs to be kind of the, the the primary focus, you know. But also, you know, you know, to McCall's point, right? Restoring confidence in the banking system was, you know, was was important, right? I'm, I'm uh, you know, we, you know, at the time of. Um, you know of the of the failure on March 10th, right? The idea, and, and and I think why it was 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 considered, or at least the the failures of SVB and Signature were deemed a you know a systemic event was was because you know there was concern that that you know that, as McCall was saying that you know confidence in the banking system overall can be you know could be shaken and lead to shock waves that uh, that we really hadn't anticipated, right? So. You know the extent to which the new bank term funding program is 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 helping rebuild that confidence and helping banks uh, you know access liquidity properly. The numbers seem to be working, but I think all of us know it's it's you know there's 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 <laughs> there's never a good time to take a victory lap in the middle of a crisis. I think you have to wait and you have to study it. Right, we're still studying even the effect of the PPP and the PPPLF program as well. So, you know. Short answer, I think we're, you know, I think inflation is top of mind for the Fed. It has to be, right? That is part of our dual mandate, right? Um, it does seem, Michael, that, uh, you know, kind of, uh, um, you know, maximum employment is, uh, you know, where the, the, the unemployment numbers are, are really quite startling, right? Considering everything else that's going on, um, you know, stable prices, that, that part of the mandate still needs some work, right? 
Um, so Michael's very optimistic and I'm, I'm very grateful for that in my life since I've told him many times, this is the first time he's been more optimistic than me. And Jim, you keyed off of that. Um, McCall, bring us to the reality, you know, as I sort of mentioned, I think in my notes to you, um, all that 5 trillion came in and 40% went into treasuries, which means 60% went into loans. And at community and regional banks, the primary recipients are businesses, commercial real estate, right? Um, I don't know where we are in the cycle. And if, if we've solved the liquidity problem, which would be fantastic if that's true, thank you, Jim, and we don't have a recession problem, thank you, Michael, then we're good. Um, but if we solve the liquidity problem, but we still have, because of an inverted yield curve, a recession problem, how does that impact the money that was extended in terms of loans? And should I be worried about solvency across the system rather than liquidity? You know, if I don't have something to worry about, I'll make it up. That's just my nature <laughs> as a banker and a CPA. You know, the 40% that went into treasuries, we all thought it was risk-free. But really, there's interest rate risk associated with it. And, and I will tell you, my 21 years of, of banking, every time a regulator comes in, you have to shock your investment portfolio. You have to shock your loans to see if they can repay. And so there's not a banking crisis. There was a bank run on a very unique bank on the West Coast and one on the East Coast that really should not have had impact that it did on the banking system as a whole, but due to, I think, social media, it created that. The other money that went into loans, I mean, this afternoon I'm going to a um, retirement party for one of our gentlemen. He's been at the bank, well, he's been in banking for like 43 years, and he had a thousand loans in his portfolio, and it totaled like $10 million. So he banks um, people on the bottom rung of the uh, economic ladder and he's had a stellar career and and bankers like him are, are are retiring and and going away but i got the best job in the world i get to make a difference in people's lives i get to make dreams come true and part of that is loaning money it, i can't do that with a deposit account and so banks are in the business of loaning money that is a risky business it has credit risk it has interest rate risk we loaned a lot of money at four percent four and a quarter we're now paying four and a quarter on a cd and so that's a, a wash I, you know I'm, I'm not making any money i need to make a four percent spread well now i'm making loans at eight percent eight and a quarter eight and a half the margin will come back but right now that 60 percent that went into loans it's underwater the thing is that people are keep paying me now will a recession hurt us yeah but we survived the great depression heck we even survived disco of the 70s I mean, two world wars. And so banking is going to have ups and downs. And as long as the consumer has confidence in the system, that it will be supported by the bank, by the FDIC, by the treasury, everything's fine. It'll work out. So we think end of the year, there'll be more credit losses because deals that worked at 4% don't work at 8%. When loans reprice, there's going to be an impact. You could have some credit issues, significant credit issues at banks. That happens for the last, you know, 150 years. It's, it's not a big deal. I, I think we need to step back. People need to understand it's a safe and sound banking system. Community banks are in good shape. Regional banks are in good shape. Large banks are in good shape. But, you know, social media has a way of creating risk where there are no risk before. And I think, you know, just recently, the, the Pope was wearing some uh, Balenciaga puffy jacket, and it went all over the news, and it turned out it was AI-generated. That's a significant issue going forward. Can people really believe what they're seeing? If Chairman Powell or Jamie Dimon or someone is on Twitter saying something, and it's not even them, that's a concern that has to be addressed long term. That is terrifying. Thank you for that. Yeah. I mean, if, if we live in a world without trust, then how do you how do you have a fractional banking system? You um, can trust your local bank. Yeah, I know. That's good. Good advertisement. And I agree. Um, so, Michael, we do have sort of a bifurcated banking system. We have the banks that are too big to fail that the government's guaranteed. 
And then we've got the banks that are below that threshold that, you know, maybe there's an implicit guarantee, but then they need congressional approval to get that maybe all the way across the system. It's 18 trillion in deposits. Not sure how you guarantee all that stuff. So, so we've got a little bit of a bifurcation problem. And you've mentioned the politics that is swarming around all of this. Uh, obviously, an upcoming election has a big you know, stake in the outcome here, too, for the future of the banking system. How are we going to resolve some being guaranteed and some not being guaranteed? And how do the political influences, because that's congressional, not central bank you know, purview, where is that conversation going to go, in your opinion? Well, so I think this just becomes part of the bigger political discussion, because the main distinction between Democrats and Republicans in the United States today is the population density of the community that you live in. And small banks tend to be in smaller communities by definition. And so there is a disproportionately large red state uh, exposure. I mean, you know, big banks are in New York and San Francisco, et cetera. So it becomes part of the political discussion along with you know, the, uh, the debt ceiling, uh, the possible restart of student loans, a uh, little thing that we call the budget of the United States, all of which have to be decided over the next three to six months, uh, and all of which will, you know, cause increased uncertainty in the system. And so, uh, <clears throat> you know, Congress needs an issue, a, a real issue, to get them to focus. If, if it's a big problem like COVID, you solve it. If it's a big problem like uh, you depend on the Russians for your energy and, and you, you're gonna freeze to death, you solve it. You know, So the question is, is this gonna become a big enough issue during this political battle that's coming up that they solve it? And you know, solving it's not that hard. You guarantee depositors 100% and then you raise fees to banks to pay for it. You know, if you don't, then banks are going to raise the cost of a mortgage to buy protection, et cetera. I mean, if you look at a mortgage today, it's still around 7%, six and three quarters, 7%, and, you know, funded by money that could be a lot, a lot cheaper than that. So normally 165 basis. Now it's about 300. Uh, banks are tightening their standards on credit cards, they're tightening their standards on auto loans. I mean, you're already seeing the reaction where banks need to raise capital if you're not going to give them the protection of you know, this guarantee for the depositors. So uh, the market's working it out. Whether we get another crisis before it has worked it out, I mean, if the First Republic goes under, that is not going to tank the system. Uh, you know, uh, the big four control half of all deposits in the United States, and it's doubtful any of them are going in. So, I mean, it, you could have a sizable problem, but you, you just took out two of the biggest, shakiest banks in the system and you've gotten through it. So I, I, I think that we are overthinking uh, this situation and that uh, the reality is that we got here because consumers and businesses have big savings cushions. Now they're scared about where to put them, but they have them, and that's a lot of protection for no matter what happens in the economy. I suspect they'll be chewing through part of that cushion as the economy slows down over the next, you know, three quarters of this year. And there might be a problem out in 2024, but I just don't, I continue to see no recession in 2023. Recessions normally come when businesses have lost money and a lot of money for you. Before they do that, my guess is they're going to lower prices and try to sell more stuff. And if they lower prices and try to sell more stuff, then the Fed will get off their back. And we'll all feel better about it. So let's just all work on getting inflation down quicker, and we'll all be happy. Jim, can you commit to that? <laughs> Maybe not. No, I mean, I certainly appreciate the, uh, yeah, right, the sentiment and certainly, you know, um, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, I mean, inflation kind of sits at the really it's, a, you know, it's a dual mandate. But, you know, when you when you when you're in the situation we are it really kind of sits uh, sits at the top of our focus right now. And so, um, you know, that's, uh, 
uh, you know, again, as I said before, though, you know, um, th there's a lot going on right now that could could change, right? I mean, we, you know, even during the, uh, you know, even during the pandemic, right, we saw kind of the the impact of of really this global economy as well. And I, you know, I'll just offer a few other things too that uh, that I think are, you know, worth thinking about, right? You know, in in this particular situation, we saw, you know, we saw the impact of technology, right? McCall, you're talking about the ability to move deposits so quickly, right? That uh, um, you know, that's that's different than in, you know, in past, uh, you know, in, in, in past episodes and past events, you know, we've seen just kind of alternate forms of, of lending and intermediation overall, right? So there are also just kind of bigger questions about the landscape of our banking system and our financial intermediation system that, you know, I think we're, we're all going to be learning about and seeing, you know, how they, you know, how that interplay ultimately affects kind of what our steady state banking system is going forward. So Michael, as our resident from uh, Lehman, right? We just saw Credit Suisse go through some death throes and now Switzerland has one bank. You know, what do we, McCall? We still got 4,000 or something here, right? Switzerland has, has one. Um, Michael, what, what happened there? And does that really tell us something about the European banking system or was that place just a function of really bad management? Yeah, well, so, the entire Swiss banking system was based on secrecy for a long, long time. And they kind of unlearned how to be bankers and learned how to be secret keepers. And when they got rid of the secret keeping, Credit Suisse was really, really bad at becoming a banker. Uh, UBS was much better. Uh, but Credit Suisse has been through a number of scandals over many years. Uh, so, I mean, I, I'm not surprised that that they win. Now you're talking about Deutsche Bank. You know, I don't see that one. But I mean, uh, you know, that's the way, as as McCall is talking about, that's the way the rumor mill is working. It keeps it picks a new name and sees if it can gin it up almost like meme stock. You know, I mean, just uh, it's crazy. Uh, I will say this. I mean, I started on the street in 1982 in the middle of the 82 recession. I lived through the, uh, the savings and loan crisis, which went on from 85 to 95. And we had a recession in there, but the 1990 recession was not one of the worst on record. And I lived through the 87 crash, and I lived through the dot-com uh, bubble bursting. We had a recession in 2000, but it wasn't one of the worst. You can have a tremendous correction in asset prices, like in 87, like in 2000, without it affecting the real economy. Now, people at the top, they don't like to hear that. But I mean, it is possible for assets to correct a lot and it still doesn't get down into the real economy. We've taken 20% off the top of the stock market. Now we pumped it in and then we took it off. Uh, I'm, I'm not projecting another drop and I'm just saying the people who are being hit tend to be those that have the cushion that allows them to absorb it. And that's a shock absorber that's not traditionally available. Normally you're laying off low income workers and they go on unemployment and they lose 50% of their income. And they react pretty violently to that. If you, know, you don't get your bonus or if your pay doesn't get raised as fast as inflation, it's a lot easier to absorb that and it has a different impact on the aggregate economy. And that seems to be the world we're in where it's the top that's doing the adjusting, not the bottom. That's the most interesting thing about it. And clearly I'm not as old as you, but I don't remember a cycle where the pain was felt at the top of the org chart, not the bottom. And Jim, it'll give you some comfort. I sat down with a subprime lender today and I said, what's your world look like? And he said, nobody wants our money because the consumers are still flush with cash and they've still got jobs. Um, so it's a very interesting cycle when the pain's at the top of the org chart, not the bottom, which also a plug for this economic theory means that inflation can fall without having to increase unemployment a ton because per person, the wages are falling faster when you fire somebody at the top of the org chart, not the bottom. Um, all right, I'm going to twist now into some of the questions and uh, I'll throw this up as a jump ball. Michael, I'm sure you see this a lot. I get this question all the time. Um, so every time we do run to the assistance of the consumer or the banks or the economy, we end up increasing the national debt, right? Um, and there's a lot of concern and it makes excellent banter on Twitter 
that ultimately the system's going to go in default. We're no longer going to be the reserve currency. You know, it's the Japanification of our economy. Um, do, have, have we gotten anywhere near a Grecian moment in your judgment, Michael, with all of the addition to the debt and the entitlements and all the projections that you've seen going out to 2050? Like how in danger is the entire country from a debt perspective to, to you know, support businesses, consumers, banks, every time there seems to be stress? Yeah, so, you know, the, the debt to GDP, as long as your debt to GDP times your interest rate is below nominal growth in your economy, you're safe. But when, you know, so if debt to GDP is 100% and your interest rate's three and you're growing five, it's not great, but you can survive that. If your debt, debt to GDP is 200 and interest rates are six and your economy is growing three, you got a serious problem. So the US is closer to, you know, about in line right now. You know, interest rates, nominal GDP last year grew, you know, 7% and interest rates are, you know, four and we're worried. Uh, so you're going to have debt to GDP that's like 175% of GDP. Now, I think GDP is slowing down and I think interest rates are going up. So it's becoming more of a burden. The debt service is becoming more of a burden, but that's partly, I saw a chart today, you know, since the great financial crisis, the consumer has run down his uh, debt 25 billion. The businesses have run it down 44 billion and the government's run theirs up 52 billion. So, I mean, basically the government took on the debt of the consumer sector and the business sector. Who do you think pays more for debt? The consumer and the business sector pay more for debt than the business sector, than the, than the government sector. So we actually reduced the interest burden by shifting the debt to the federal government. Uh, not saying I do that every day, but that's kind of what happened during the financial, during the, the COVID crisis is the government took on the debt, refinanced, the entire United States uh, at a lower interest rate. And guess what? It was stimulative. We're growing. I mean, I love a crisis, right? Because there's always outsized stimulus, which is super good for the stock market. Um, so, you know, go ahead, Jim, do everything you can to support us. Um, McCall, you may get that question as well. I mean, do people have anxiety um, in conversations you have about general systematic debt levels, and does that have any influence on on consumer behavior in your world? It, it, it does. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll say that politici politicians do two things well, nothing and overreact. <laughs> and, and this is going to be a situation where they overreact. You know, I can remember when President Obama said he was going to punish the large banks for the mortgage crisis. And the large banks got larger and more small banks went away. You know, people don't realize, but a bank our size pays four to five hundred thousand a year for FDIC insurance. It's a lot of money. If we have unlimited insurance, does that cost us a million, five million, ten million? We only made ten million dollars last year. I mean, when does it become unfeasible to have a small bank because you can't afford insurance? I, I will tell you, our customers, and again, we're a consumer-focused bank, not really a business bank. Consumers are nervous about the debt. We're thirty-one trillion in debt you know, 52% reprices in the next 24 months, it's going to reprice higher. And so do they issue more debt to pay the higher interest rate on the debt? I mean, there's issues that create uh, long-term problems for our country that need to be addressed. But again, no one in DC is addressing that problem. We get deeper and deeper in debt. I, I'm not a believer in modern monetary theory. I know it works on paper, but it didn't work, you know, in Rome. And so I'm not sure it's going to work now. And so I believe we need to get our fiscal house in order because everyone from the federal government to the state government to individuals is very comfortable with debt. And debt is not your friend. When I, when I go speak to high schools, I, I, I tell the children, they want to loan me money, not me loan them money. They should be savers for life. And so should our country. <laughs> That's uh, that's good advice, but not good for your shareholders. Um, so let's consider that. Um, 
Hey, uh, guys, we got a couple more minutes here. Are there other points that I missed? And and Jim, I'll throw you one thing we, we sort of talked about yesterday. Um, recessions aren't necessarily bad. They take out some of the, the, the weak players. And we used to have bank failures, et cetera. And now we seem to be trying to outlaw those. Um, you know, is, is it possible that recession, you know, even if, if, it, if it comes and, and it's shallow, should it be allowed to do some of its work? Or, or do you feel like we need to intervene and um, charge McCall more fees to do it? <laughs> I don't know, since it's McCall, let's see. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, the Fed is never going to be in favor of a, of a recession, right? But obviously, you know, some of the steps that, um, that, that we're taking are, are you know, are, are, are designed to, you know, to, to cool down the economy. I, I, I get that. I think the broader question really is on, you know, when we look back to 2008, 2009, I believe from the, the financial crisis period, pretty consistently for a couple of years, I think we totaled around 500 bank failures, you know, uh, McCall largely, you know, largely community banks, right? So we have a mechanism in place for failure. Um, uh, the, the, some of the more, uh, in some of the larger institutions that had similar trouble, um, Washington Mutual in particular, which was the largest uh, bank failure in the, you know, in the U.S. prior, was, um, you know, there was there was assistance in that transaction, and obviously once once uh, you know some of the larger banks, there were some questions there, you know, some um, you know some some interventions came in, really looking at you know overall systemic risk to the financial system, but. You know, I think the core question is, and you know, we talk about from an economic standpoint, creative destruction, right? Businesses should fail, right? And, and and new ones should be born. And I guess maybe that's probably the the broader point, right? We have, you know, um, uh, I think it's 40, 4,700 uh, bank charters in the United States. There's a there's a large swath of charters in the in the in the central quarter of the country, uh, due in large part to kind of an agricultural legacy in the in this part of the country, and they. You know they they meet the needs of their communities and their customers, right? But we saw prior to that that um, you know some uh, you know uh, some banks made some made some bad decisions and you know and ultimately were uh, you know were um, you know uh, were were failed as part of their process you know as part of that process. One of the bigger issues right now, I think, is you know McCall. We haven't seen a lot of de novo activity, right? So we we know that you know I guess the peak of de novo activity. Was 1999, right? We had we had uh, over 200 banks formed in that year, and it's really been a very steady, um, steady decline since then. And you know, right after the financial crisis, we had one or two years there of of no de novo formation. And I think I think it's fair to say that the the amount of banks that we've you know we've seen. Um, you know, uh, you know, kind of develop over the uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, it's, it's it's been so small that it's effectively zero, right? And that's I think that's a challenge for an industry, right? A healthy industry needs, you know, right? You need to you need the bad participants to leave, and you need new ones to come in, and you need the strong ones to continue to be strong. So we're we're missing that other part of the equation, you know, this this new bank formation. And I I think some of it is, as I mentioned before, there's there's technological opportunities coming into play. There's you know, I you know I do hear some stories that maybe it's a little more profitable to buy an existing bank charter and try to apply that business model versus go from a de novo standpoint. But you know, again, trying to you know you know to McCall's bank and many others, you know, the, the community bank infrastructure in this is, country is not there accidentally, right? It's there to serve very specific needs in communities and do it in a way, you know, that relationship-based model takes in into account all of this soft information that at least at this point, right, we can't, you know, algorithmically do. And so that's, that's very important, I think, to, you know, to this country and to our economy. And so I'm, I guess I'm more focused on the other side of the equation, you know, and, and, and trying to figure out ways to, you know, to, to see more new entrants into this, uh, you know, into this landscape for us. And, you know, McCall, maybe you've got some solutions, but uh, we, we haven't seen a lot of activity lately. You know, Jim, I, I would say from, my days as a CPA auditing banks and now being a banker, the barriers to entry are pretty high. I mean, when, when I joined the bank, we didn't really have a compliance person. Now I have four people in compliance. You know, our IT department was really a, a part-time person. Now I've got five people in IT. When, when you look at what we pay our core providers, it, it is almost cost prohibitive to enter this industry. And I think that's why you see people want to buy charters. Um, the country needs local banks and, and, and credit unions. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, you know, moving credit into that equation. You know, you, you need help at a local level. I, I think it builds communities over time. 
The problem is it's very expensive to run a bank now. The margins just aren't there. The return on equity. If if I was a wealthy person investing in something, it probably wouldn't be a bank. Now it's a consistent return, or it should be. That's what I tell our shareholders. I want to beat the S and P 500, but I'm not going to beat it by much. You know, if you want to make 25 percent a year, go invest your money somewhere else. And so we try to be pretty consistent year over year. But that doesn't attract a lot of capital. And usually, if it does, it's a pretty risky profile, like maybe an SVB that's very targeted on a specific industry. Well, guys, we're coming up towards the end of this. Um, I think what I heard is the government gave the people $5 trillion. The people gave the $5 trillion to the banks. The <laughs> banks gave the $5 trillion back to the government in form of treasuries. The government raised interest rates on the treasuries, which caused the banks a problem. So the government's going to bail out the banks with the people's money. Um, <laughs> Did I get that right? I think I did. But Except here's my big takeaway. Here, here's my big takeaway from the whole thing. First of all, McCall is a fantastic representative of old school, traditional community banking, obviously sober minded. McCall, I'm, I'm convinced there's not going to be a run on the Bank of Fayette County. Um, Jim, I appreciated your candor in sort of, you know, opining on the business of the Fed. It's certainly not an easy job to do, especially when your dance partner is the federal government. You're not actually allowed to work with them. Um, so that's very odd. And then, Michael, I just, you're, you're intrepid in your optimism right now. I'm just so comforted by this. And so essentially what you're saying is, everybody, it's a tempest in a teapot. Don't stress out. Out. We're making too much of this. And the market seems to be sniffing that out because the S&P, which you referenced and you know I have interest in, um, is still up on the year. So um, I hope this ended up being a useful conversation with obviously some extremely wise um, and talented members and, and people in the ecosystem around the Memphis Economic Club. And Douglas, it's your leadership that brought us to this moment. So with that, I'll hand the microphone back to you and uh, Thanks for, for thinking about this and putting it all together. Not a problem. Thank you, David, so much for being moderator. Also, thank you to McCall and Jim and Michael for being on the panel, especially with such a quick notice and this rapid turnaround so that way we can get good information to people. David, uh, great wrap up. The only thing I will add to your wrap up is I believe in quote that you said, St. Louis Fed is the best data resource. Your words, not mine, but of course, we endorse those words, and or I would say not endorse, but I like those words. I would say I like those words. I do want to remind everybody as well that we do have upcoming sessions, uh, both uh, for Lynn William Kong. That's going to be a session on fintech, and that will be April sixth. Also, memberships so that you can go online. You can be able to find out about memberships, be able to attend more sessions like this, and then give us feedback. You know, today was something that I want to thank you to. Eustace Corrigan, who is one of our, who received this, is one of our executive committee members. Literally, uh, we were having a call about another meeting. I had dropped off the call. Eustace came up. So this is his idea. Eustace came up with this idea. We took it and uh, ran with it. And due to his very capable uh, insight and also leadership there. So thank him for that. But this is part of the session that you'll be able to access as a member of the Economic Club of Memphis. So thanks a lot to everybody. I look forward to seeing you all soon. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.